who has true power in society. Now, this morning I was reading this book, Lessons of History, by Will and Aria Durant. They're uh, Pulitzer Prize winners, which is like the highest kind of accolade you can get from uh, writing and books. And there's this really interesting quote in here, which I'm going to read to you, which I really agree with. Now it says, history reports that the men who can manage men manage the men who can manage only things. And the men who can manage money manage all. Now, there's a lot of wisdom in that. I mean, um, Will Durant, he's he's dead now. He wrote a series of books um, called, uh, based on history. So, um, The Story of Civilization, which is like a, I think it's a 10, 12 book kind of series on different civilizations, mainly Western civilizations though, uh, but still very good read. Um, he, he wrote another book called Story of Philosophy, which I really like. Um, as well as this book and a few other books mainly based on history now from that quote what it's saying is I mean think about it if you, you're at a job like you're managing stuff so say you work in McDonald's or something now the people at the counter they're managing tills they're managing food and all this kind of things dealing with customers but then who makes more money the managers because they're managing the people at the place now who makes even more money than the managers, the investors, you know, people like um, Ray A. Kroc, who started, who, well, he never started the business, the McDonald's brothers started it, but he franchised it, you know, uh, he was able to manage money, which is why he manages that empire, you know, um, and it's interesting reading that, because I'm looking at a lot of books right now, um, especially looking at a lot of different successful people, like, I'm reading this book currently about Elon Musk, He's the founder of Tesla, SpaceX, and Solar Sea. Um, you know, these are all companies that kind of focus on alternative living. You know, SpaceX is about sending humans to Mars, you know, colonizing Mars. Um, Tesla is like electronic cars. And Solar Sea is about um, solar powered energy, you know, for homes. And it's really interesting reading this book now this is a man with vision and also the fact that he and Peter Thiel actually started PayPal now he sold his shares of PayPal for like over a hundred million dollars something like that I don't know the exact numbers but what he did with his money was he put it all into those three companies and people thought it was crazy you know oh you know why are you starting a new car company and all this business and people sending people to Mars and, you know, people that need solar-powered energy. And it's funny because when you look at history as well, a lot of people thought a lot of the things we're doing now were crazy at the time. You know, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Well, he was a madman. Oh, the, like, there's even quotes about the internet. No one will use the internet. No one will buy stuff off like, online. So be careful what you, what you lack in vision, you know, what you think is crazy, you know. Uh, because human beings were born to innovate. Um, but anyway, just going with that example, what would most people do when they make a hundred million? They'd go and spend it on nice, lavish cars and houses and, you know, holidays and whatever, you know. But what an investor does, with an investor mindset, is they think about foregoing pleasant pleasure for future gain. So it's a very stoic mindset. So he actually put all of his money in there in those companies to the point where he had to sleep on a couch you know he had to um, ask a friend if he could sleep on the couch because he had no money to pay rent he was willing to make that sacrifice now he's a multi-billionaire he's the only man right now on the Forbes list with three companies that are worth over a billion dollars net worth so you know <laughs> <laughs> what Will Durant was saying about the men who manage money manage all is very true you know and it's not just him as an example reading Michael Jordan's book The Life you know I've read like half of this book already and it's so fascinating um, this guy's not lucky he's not talented he's a skilled athlete he's someone who put focus in and time into his craft but what he did smart which what a lot of athletes don't do is he invested in himself, you know. I don't know if you look around and you see people wearing Michael, uh, Jordans, you know, Jordan shoes or, or, or clothing, you know. 
he he worked with Phil Knight, you know, the owner of Nike, to develop that, you know, and he because he, uh, uh, at first he was endorsed by Nike, but then he branched off as his own. Now he's a multi billionaire, you know. Again, there's many athletes. How many? There's so many athletes that they make money doing what they they make a lot of money doing their sport, but they end up broke. You know, it happened to Mike Tyson made over half a half a billion in boxing, but he ended up broke, you know, and he couldn't afford, like, it said in his autobiography, he couldn't even afford a hotel, you know, at one point to stay the night, you know. <laughs> this is a man who made over 500 million, you know, in boxing. So it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep and how hard the money works for you. It's how smart you are as an investor, you know. It's not about working hard and all that business that they teach you in schools and all that nonsense. But, and these, all these examples Paul Allen reading about him co-owner of Microsoft same example you know Richard Branson same example there's a, there's a story in this book where he was on an island on a holiday or something like that and how they couldn't get off the island there was some um, some problems I think there was a, an actual disaster or something like that I can't remember the exact story but what the the essence of the story was this he decided to charter a plane and uh, to get himself off the island and then not only did he think about well everyone else was moaning about it and going oh we can't get off and whinging and whining he he managed to charter a plane so he invested in that no he didn't only think about himself he thought about oh, well if i need to get off the island there's other people who need to get off the island so he ended up selling tickets to other people so not only did he manage to get himself off the island but he ended up making a profit and making <laughs> making money while helping other people get off the island and that's how virgin airlines actually started so that's another example this book it's about steven spielberg and two of his business partners who started dreamworks studios i'm sure you've seen the dreamworks studios in front of many of Spielberg's films, you know, if you look at any of his uh, films like Saving Private Ryan or, um, you know, uh, the BFG, all these kind of things, you'll see the DreamWorks Studios logo come up. He started that with um, with a couple of business partners. They put money into the company. I think they put in about, um, was it $50 million, something like that, into the company, but it wasn't enough to start a studio. So then they went to um, Steve Barmer, who is the uh, CEO of Microsoft. We just looked at Paul Allen. We went to him and got him to invest um, some money into the company, I think it was $700 million, to start DreamWorks. And yeah, <laughs> Steven Spielberg is a billionaire. You know, he's an investor. He's not just a director. He's an investor, you know, he's a businessman, he owns, you know, his own studio. And I see a lot of people doing that. I see Brad Pitt, he, he owns his own studio, Plan B, you know, you've got James Cameron, he owns um, Lightstorm, you know, that, and that's kind of the path I want to go on. I want to own my own studio as well. So I'm not just an artiste, I'm a businessman because it's um, the movie business at the end of the day. So you want to control, you want to have control of your art. Otherwise, you're letting other people control your art, you know. So, Phil Knight just talked about him, you know. Started Nike, had the vision to go to Japan and and to see different cultures and, and what they were doing. And that's how he came up with the idea for Nike. Um, that he knew how to raise the capital and he understood accounting, you know. So, he understood to manage how to manage money. You got Floyd Money Mayweather, man who's in the news right now. Guess he's making over a hundred million for his fight with Conor McGregor. That should be happening in in a few weeks. Um, now the reason why he makes that much is because again he has Mayweather produ uh, promotions. You know he's not just a boxer. You know he's a businessman as well. And when they were doing the deal with Conor McGregor, Dana White said that he when they, the deal went so smooth and he was so impressed with the people around around um, Mayweather that he's hired a lot of smart people to kind of manage his business, to run his business. So he's a man who manages money and he manages it all, you know? So hence why this fight's happening is because of Mayweather Productions. He's able to make 100 million on the fight, plus 
he makes um, money on the back end in terms of um, the the pay per view numbers. He gets percentage of the pay per view numbers on top of that, and Conor McGregor will be getting that too, but not as much obviously because Mayweather's doing the May- Mayweather Promotions is doing the promoting for the fight, and he's obviously the main draw. We've got James Cameron. Highest grossing movie of all time, Avatar, and second highest grossing movie of all time, um, Titanic. The man I'm looking to beat, but you've got to, you've got to beat them. You've got to understand them. That's why I got this book. I'm reading this book. It's about the life of James Cameron. Like I said, he owns Lightstorm. You know, um, he's he his last film, Avatar, was in 2009. Now he's doing four sequels to Avatar. And the films, he's been developing them for so long. It's been almost nine nine years. Um, sorry, not nine years, eight years since Avatar was released. But he's he's being patient. He's a, he's a visionary. So he doesn't usually just put films out there every so often. I mean, 2009 was his last film, Avatar. Broke all the box office records. Before then, it was Titanic in two thousand. Uh, sorry, 1997, which, again, was the highest grossing movie of all time before Avatar came out. But, again, he's an investor, which is why he has his own, he's, his own company. He's very much on uh, creating um, new cinema. He's, he's, about, he's about kind of revolutionising the, the visual experience and the, uh, of cinema, you know. And I was reading, when I was reading Arnold Schwarzenegger's book, Total Recall, he's like an autobiography. He was saying how impressed he was by how well he managed the set. He understood like different people's roles. Like he understood the lighting guy. He understood you know the stunt people, and they showed him so much respect because he had an understanding of the craft. He invested in his his time in his craft and his money now in his film studios. You know, the man Warren Buffett most successful investor of all time, second richest man in the world, invest, owner of Berkshire Hathaway, this, this, these com- this company acquires companies, you know, all Warren Buffett does all day is read, you know, he reads books, reads um, autobiographies, um, he reads newspapers from different countries to see the trends, he invests his time in doing that, and he invests his money, more importantly, because one of the things he does read is annual reports, so you can see the numbers of the company, and then he can purchase the company. So, again, he's an investor. He's a, he, he puts his money into companies that are going to make him better returns. So he knows how to, he knows how to evaluate companies. He's called a value investor. So he looks at what they call the intrinsic value of companies. Um, so he's purchased Coca-Cola. He's got, I think, Berkshire Hathaway owned 10% of Coca-Cola. Geico, Dairy Queen, you know, the list goes on. So he he understands that he wants it it's important to have your money work hard for you again. And that's why he's the second richest man in the world. He's got a net worth of I think seventy five billion, something like that. It's just behind Bill Gates, who again is another investor. While other people when they have fifty thousand when they raise fifty thousand dollars would go on holiday Bill Gates invested it in purchasing DOS, which is the operating system that they use to create Microsoft. Microsoft is one of the biggest companies in the world, and now Bill Gates is this. He's been the richest man in the world for like sixteen years in a row, something like that. But again, he knew how to manage his money, so now he manages all. And with that wealth and impact, he's helped eradicate diseases like smallpox and things like that. So he's been very phil- phil- uh, He's a bit of a philanthropist right now. Um, but again, it started by you know developing Microsoft and revolutionizing computer technology. Howard Schultz, I'm sure in your mornings you look you see a lot of people going to Starbucks to buy coffee. This man invested in coffee, you know, and now it's just, I think they're catching up or they've caught up with McDonald's. I heard um, a couple of years ago that they opened like over seven hundred stores in China. Again. He's managing his money. He's investing money in opening those stores in China, and it's making him wealthy. He's a billionaire. Another current book I'm reading is Creative Inc. Creativity Inc. by this guy Ed Catmull. So he's the president of uh, Pixar and Disney Animation. Again, another investor. You know, someone who managed money. You know, he knew how to raise capital. You know, he was. 
he's an animator and he wanted to work for Disney. They didn't quite see his vision of having the first animated film, you know, computer generated film. They kind of looked at him like he was crazy. Even when he was working with George Lucas at Lucasfilm, like George Lucas and himself and a few other people wanted to start video editing um, on computers because what they used to do back in the day was they used to cut the film and edit it manually. Um, and then when they brought the ideas to the editors, they thought they, they weren't, didn't have the vision, you know, they didn't have an investor mindset. They was like, oh, you know, this is silly. Why would we want to do that? Again, a lot of things you see people back in history thought were crazy. You know, I think it's crazy now that they used to edit like that because, I mean, I work in post-production. I'm a creative producer. So I work with, you know, Premiere Pro. I've worked with After Effects. I work for After Effects. I've worked with Final Cut and other programs. So these are all uh, non-linear editing softwares. So this is all done on the computer. But back in the day, George Lucas and, and this, this gentleman here, they were pioneering the technology that we're now using now. They were, but because people, they, they're stuck in their ways, they didn't want to adapt to the new technology. They'd rather do it the hard way, which is what you see a lot of people doing today even now. So be careful, you know, your lack of vision. But again, he knew how to raise capital. So when they were having some troubles and then Steve Jobs came along, because obviously he got fired from Apple and, um, Steve Jobs ended up being a, an investor and a, you know a co-founder in, in in Pixar animation, and then they ended up producing Toy Story, which is the first computer-generated film, and it did very well. And the rest is history. Look at Pixar now; that every animated film that comes out, they get they, it's like a an awards you know winning film or you know critically acclaimed film. You know, you got Toy Story, you got Monsters Inc., you've got all these films. You know, so what Will Durant was saying in that book Lessons from History about the men who manage men will only manage will manage the men who can manage only things so if you're just doing your job and you're just focused on you know that one thing you're not going to make as much money as people who can manage people who can lead people but the investors are the ones who run the world if you don't believe me look at the Forbes list go and go and google the Forbes list the the top 500 richest people in the world and see what they do they're all investors they own companies they invest in they invest their money in various things it's not there's no magic pill but a lot of them are investors they know how to manage their money so this is a lesson for you, for, for myself as well to be better with money and to understand it so that's one lesson i got from this morning reading Durant so leave a comment down below let me know what you think and if you've read any of Will Durant stuff if you um, if you're an investor and your opinion on this subject I'd like to know anyway talk to you later peace